Okay, I think you can see it too. Uh, because we didn't know if this class was going to make or not, but since you needed to graduate, so we're going to let it run. Um, I don't have the syllabus updated. I'll try to get that done as soon as I can. When that's going to be, I don't know. Um, hopefully, I'll get to work on it some Friday. I'll have a little time this afternoon, but I've still got to be canceling classes and stuff. And then tomorrow, I've got classes almost all day long. So Friday may be the earliest time I'll get to update, but we'll see. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah, okay. It does have a course title on this one. One of my last ones was missing course title. I thought, i got to get that corrected. Okay. Obviously, this is wrong. This is fall 2016, but spring 2017, but it will be appropriate for the first mini term this term. This is Math 227, Calculus 3, four credit hour course. Um, wow, way too far. Okay. Class meeting times, days and time. These are not quite right, but they're close. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, 12 to um, 1.40, right? 12 to 1.40. Okay, the room is right. Building uh, room A255, A building, bathroom campus. All that's right. This is just 12 to 1.40. Okay, my, my name is Charles Fowler. All of you have had me in class before, so I'll skip some of this. You know my email address, okay? You know my phone, but those of you who haven't been in my class recently, this phone only works now on the Bessemer campus. It doesn't ever, it used to work on the Birmingham campus, it doesn't anymore. I'll get to that. Okay, my office is still the same as it was, 265, uh, in the Birmingham campus, just as it was before, academic building, uh, B building, B122, Dr. Pruitt's office, the room behind that, they have changed the phone in there. It's no longer my number. It's a different number. They now have a NASA grant, and they have a grant administrator or coordinator or something like that. She uses that. She's part-time. She uses the office sometime between Monday and Thursday, and but she's not there on Friday, so I use it on Friday. But because she needed her home phone number, they put a, that phone has a different number, so I'll have to get the number. I don't know what it is, but I'll try to get it and update that on the uh, syllabus. Now, I'll give you my office hours as I know them now, okay? Monday and Wednesday, I have an 8 o'clock class and a 9.30 class. 9.30 class is another calculus class that ends at 11.10, so my office hours are 11.15 until 12, because this class starts at 12 now, so that's not 12.15, but 12. Okay, uh, this class goes <coughs> 12 to 1.40. My next class goes 2 to uh, 3.15, and then I've given up my two physics classes, so the second part of this will be 3.15 until it's either going to be 4.45, 5.15, something like that, okay? Now, Tuesday, Thursday, I know for sure, these are not the right times, but I do know for sure. I have an 8 o'clock class, I have a 9.30 class, that ends at 10.45, so that would be 10.45, and for first mini term, my uh, office hours are 10:45 until 12:30 for the first mini term. Then I have a 12:30 class that's a mini term physical science class, so it has two and a half hours of lab uh, class, two hours of lab, so that takes me 12:30 to five. And after five, I'm back in the office until about 5:15 in the evening. So too short a time. I won't even put that down. Now, once second mini term gets here. My second mini term physical science class won't start until 1.15. The automotive students are taking that class and they don't get through with theirs until 1 o'clock, so we'll start this one at 1.15. So then my office hours will be 10.45 to 1.15, but then I'll be in class from 1.15 until 5.45. And then I'll be leaving sometime before 6, by 6. Okay, Fridays, most of the time, 7.45 to 11.45. I think I've told you before in both terms, uh, they love calling meetings on Fridays, so sometimes I'll be in meetings and I won't be in the office, actually. The other thing, we do have at least one Friday coming up, we have math meetings, and I think I said before, I thought they were at Shelton State, now that I think about it, that's where they were last year, 
I think this year it's going to be at Huntington College down in Montgomery. Okay? No, I may be thinking. I'm sorry, that's my physics meetings. We, I do have a set of those there on Saturday. The uh, math meetings, I don't remember where they are. So, so one Friday I won't be here for that. And two Fridays, one in February and one in April, I'll have infusions because of my treatments. Okay? I don't know when they'll be yet either. But except for that, most Friday I'll be able to work. Now, again, just like I have said before, I don't write this course description. This is one for this course. This is the third, and I did change something in it because originally they had, this is the third of T courses. <laughs> you know, they left out the HR. Made no sense. I put in the HR even though I wasn't supposed to check it out. I think they've corrected it now. So this is the third of three courses in basic calculus sequence. The topics include vector functions, and by the way, let me go on and compare the topics with the chapters. Vector functions are basically chapter 13, calculus of vector value functions. Uh, functions of two or more variables, that's chapter 14, differentiation in several variables. Uh, I lost it now, oh, there it is, partial derivatives, okay? That is what differentiation of two or more variables is. So that begins in 14.3, including applications, and we have some of those in there too. Quadrant surfaces, that's in chapter 12. It's specifically 12.6, okay? So hang on to that. That may be where we we're beginning. It depends on where we left off last time. I'll have to get with y'all to remind me. Um, Multiple integration, that's chapter 15, multiple integration, and vector calculus, and it says includes uh, Gray's theorem, Carl and divergent surface integrals, and Stokes theorem. So what they call that here is line and surface integrals. They are surface integrals, that's chapter 16, and chapter 17 is fundamental theorems of vector analysis, which are Green's theorem, Carl and divergence, and uh, Stokes theorem. Okay, so that's chapter 17. That is a lot, especially some of these chapters have eight, six, you know, seven sections, that kind of stuff. So whether we'll get that far, I'm not sure, but we'll get as far as we can. And you'll have everything you need to build on it in case you need the, the other stuff. Now, <clears throat> next question I have, I had marked in here how far we got. Um, and I think if I have the paper in the right place, that may have been around, uh, no, this is Cal 3. I pulled, I, I moved the paper out. Sorry about that. How far did we get in Cal 2? Do you remember? Huh? Eight. Eight? Okay. Yeah, we skipped chapter 9. We didn't do anything on infinite series and sequences and series? Nothing at all. Okay. How about you in Cal 2? How far did you get? Um, I took 18. Oh, okay. You scored for this. So you scored in the Cal 3. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you did. In your AP, how far did you get? Do you even remember? You didn't do infinite series. Okay, it looks like we'll start with infinite se sequences and series. So we'll start in chapter 10. And we'll do just two sections in 10, quickly, sequences and series. Then we'll do chapter 11, parametric equations. <clears throat> and I think what we'll do is just two sections there. Parametric equations, arc length, and speed. <clears throat> Don't think we need the, the others. Then we'll do vector geometry. And we'll, we'll hit the high points there. The thing is, for those who have had physics, have, yeah, you had physics, you have physics, you have it. Okay, so I guess we do need to hit. See, you've already done a lot of what uh, Chapter 12 does, dot products and cross products and those kinds of things in physics. 
But since you haven't had it, we'll try to hit chapter 12. We'll hit real quickly, and that's where we're supposed to start off. So we'll start with 10, 1 and 2, 11, 1 and 2, and then we'll do a real quick review of 12. And at 12.6, we'll kind of slow down a little bit and, and start going through stuff as we go. So I doubt if we'll get all the way to the end since we have so much to pick up. But the first two sections of 10 are not going to be bad. So basically what I think then, I'm thinking out loud, we'll get to this later. Uh, we'll do 10.1, 10.2, 11.1, 11.2 and have the first test. Then we'll do chapter 12 and have the second test. Chapter 13, third test, fourth test. So when we get there, remind me of that. But anyway, I'll show you where that is on here. So, prerequisites. You have to have completed Math uh, 126, which is Cal 2, or scored for it. Way to go. Okay. The text is this text. Calculus, early transcendentals, for some reason he wrote that on the side. Third edition, John Rogowski and Colin Adams. I need to clear that up because when they changed editions I didn't pick up they added a name. Uh, it's a Freeman text, that's the publisher. It's 2015 so it should be good for another year or two uh, but since this is Cal 3 this is the last time y'all will be needing it but if you want to sell it back to the bookstore you should be able to because we'll use this again next year. Okay, uh, be sure you bring paper to class because we'll be working. Calculus in class, every class, maybe not today, but most class. Graph paper if you need it. You, if you like to just pick it off with a line paper, that's fine too. Pencils and or pens, it's up to you. I tend to make errors when I do math, so I like to use pencils, but you can do the other. I think you've all heard me do my spiel on this paragraph on Blackboard, right? So I won't go through that again. The course student learning outcomes. Let's hit those. Okay. Students will graph and classify quadric surfaces. Okay, we'll actually begin a little earlier. We'll do infinite sequences and series and begin the parametric equations, that kind of stuff. But in chapter 12, we will do that. Students will work with and perform calculus operations on vector functions, compute arc length, speed, curvature, and describe motions in free space. That's chapter 13. It's called vector calculus. Students will work on functions of several variables, compute limits, take partial derivatives, applying them to tangent planes, gradients, directional derivatives, and the chain rule. That's chapter 14. I think that's kind of Students will perform multiple integration. Those are not right. Yeah, they are, I guess. Let me see. I don't want to be telling you all. That's chapter 12. 13. 14, yeah, okay, we have several. That's 13, this is 14. Students will work with functions of several variables, compute limits, blah, 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 okay. Students will perform multiple integration techniques and apply them, that's chapter 15. And then students will perform line and surface integrals, applying them to Green's theorem, Slate's theorem, and Divergence theorem, that's 16 and 17 combined, okay. Students will write and re research and write on a topic in calculus. You get to choose it. Okay, now will we get this far? Not with the other stuff maybe that we had at the beginning, but we'll get as far as we can. Now the other bad news, and I think I mentioned this to my other classes, for some reason, the powers that be here decided not to start class on Monday. They started yesterday. So therefore, we missed Monday. This week we'll only have class on Wednesday. And guess what happens next week? Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Day is Monday. So we have no class on Monday. Sorry about that. And we'll have class on Wednesday. So when we have class on Wednesday, think about it, that will be our second class for uh, Tuesday and Thursday students. They will have already had three classes with their fourth class the next day. So we'll be basically a week behind. Tuesday, Thursday classes, of course, there's no other Cal 3, but it's just a pain in the neck. They did, we didn't have class on Monday. Okay, now weather, that sort of worked out good for us, but because of weather, but still, we, it's 
bad thing to use. Okay, but we will research uh, and write on a topic in calculus. Now, the competencies follow right along there. I'm just going to add one more for when I do this. Chapter 10, uh, infinite sequences and series. Chapter 11, parametric equations. I'm going to, the title is and polar coordinates, but we're just going to do that. So we'll have a test on 10 and 11. Sequences and series and parametric equations. And I can't remember the other topics there. Uh, arc length and speed. Okay, we'll do those. That will be a test together. In chapter 12, vector geometry, we'll have a test on that. In chapter 13, vector variable functions, that's a test on that. Um, differenti differentiation, several variables, test on that. Multiple integration, test on that. As far as we can, and then these two will go together in the one test. If we get that far, okay, no guarantee there. So I'll sort of redo that a little bit. Writing competency will be your research paper, and the overall competency will be the final examination. But guess what? It's not going to be comprehensive. Wherever we are at the end, the last chapter test will be your final exam. Because everything builds on itself, so when you do that last chapter test, you really are being tested on everything you've had before. So that will, whatever the last chapter test is, there's no way we're going to finish all of it. Wherever we are at the end, that will be your final exam. Okay. Now, that has a little other implication here. Okay. The research paper is required, not optional. It will count as a test grade that cannot be dropped. The chapter test will be given after each of the chapters or units, like we talked about before. The lowest chapter score may be dropped, and the final exam, which is your last chapter test, will may not be dropped. It will count as one test score, that last chapter test. However, you can't say, oh, I've made A's on everything, do I get to drop the final note? Because that final is sort of your culmination, one of the competencies we have to have the score for. Okay? So therefore, you can't drop the research paper, you can't drop the final, you can't drop one of the other test scores, whichever is the lowest one. Okay? If it helps you, I don't drop it. If you made high on those and low on the others, if it helps you, I'll leave it in there. Okay, then at the end, I'll average the grades, and A's or B's, A's or 90's, B's or 80's, 70's or C's, don't go down here, okay? If it looks like you are going down there, it's probably better to withdraw than to get a D or an F, period, okay? And that's what this is talking about, attendance, if you can't be here in class, you're probably not going to get the material you need. Even though I record things, you can't interact with one another and me and ask questions and that kind of stuff. So really, it's a better idea to withdraw rather than make a D or an F. All the way around, even though there's financial aid implications, it's still you have those if you make these or else. So there's no difference except it doesn't hurt your grade point average to withdraw and it does make a D or an F. Make up work. Oh, and by the way, I didn't ask this. Y'all prefer take-home tests or in-class tests? Uh, wow. wow, I'm amazed. Okay, well, we'll have take-home tests. Um, and typically you have about a week. The reason I say a week is so you always have at least one class day to ask questions. If something's not clear on the test, you don't know what I'm asking you about, or you can't, don't even have a clue of how to begin, you can find any exercise in the homework I'll work any of those in class if they're similar to the test questions that can give you a clue, okay? So, and then the other reason I give you at least a week is you always have a weekend in case you're working and stuff. That might be your best time to get it done. So, try to get it done in a week, but I'm not hardcore about that. If you need more time, you can have it, but just don't hang on to it so long we're into the next test, you know. That's bad for you, it's bad for your classmates. Because I can't return the other test until I get all of you on that. Okay? So please get them in as soon as you can. You cannot drop one major chapter test, not counting the paper, and not counting the final, the last test. I will try to be here at 12 o'clock every day. I only have at most 15 minutes, I mean 45 minutes for lunch. Because my last class ends at uh, the previous class in. 
uh, at 11, 11 10. But it takes me about five minutes to get shut down here and down there. So usually about 11 15 is when I get to the office or later, and then I have to leave to come here at 12. So I cram down, well, as much as fast as I can. Most of the time I can get it done in 45 minutes. Today I had to <coughs> change something for two, three instructors and also print out my things here so I didn't have that much time. So I'll try to be here at 12. You can. Great so far. Perfect attendance so far. All right. I think you've all heard about discrimination, harassment. Any questions on that? We don't tolerate it. Don't let it happen. If you think you see it, let us know. Even suspect it, let us know. We like to nip it in the proverbial butt. Americans with disability, any questions on that? I think you hear that every class, right? If you let us know, we'll go with it. Grievance procedures, if you don't think you're given a fair shake, we'll help you write us up. You know, you could write us, do the grievance procedure. Okay, the course calendar, of course, this is for last fall. I'll update this for the spring. It's on the website under academic calendar. You can look at it there. That's where I get it from and put it here. I may leave out a few things, but you know, that's basically what we have here. And then finally, once I get this, the syllabus updated, I will put it on Blackboard under content for this course, and then I'll let you know when it's there, and then you can either print this, uh, print, sign, and date, and give it to me, or you can Type in and email it to me. I don't care. Okay. Any questions on the syllabus? Okay. This is going fast because all of you have heard all of it before. Okay. So through with the syllabus. All right. Now let's talk about the research paper. You've heard it all before, right? Any questions about it? You pick your topic. You know how to do. Here it is. It'll be on Blackboard. Actually, as soon as this gets uploaded uh, to um, YouTube, you can see it there. Because here it is. I won't read it all to you. You've heard it all before. Uh, just reminding you to turn in a page from one of your sources. Okay. Um, and you know when it's due. Yeah, the bonus points, I'll have to change the months, but if you turn it in the month of January, you get four bonus points, February 3, March 2, April 1, May, I think we only have one class day in May, but if you turn it in that day, you don't get any bonus points. If you turn it in after that day, you start losing points. So please get it done earlier rather than later. Okay? Any other questions about the paper? Two of you have heard it already today. You heard it last term. Yeah, you can pick any topic that you're interested in. You can get the topic out of the book, but you can't use the book as a source. Okay. And uh, I guess I should have uh, said a little something about that. But yeah, I think we just said it now. But remember, you can also do an internet application, like a YouTube video or something that you find. Describe something that we're going to be doing here, or have done, and say, wow, this makes it so much clearer or understandable or whatever, then you can certainly um, write on that as well. So it doesn't have to be research, just anything that has to do with it. But the text can give you plenty of ideas, but, and just... Look at what we've just said in doing this. Infinite series, parametric equations, arc length, vector geometry, uh, the cross products, dot products, uh, calculus of vector value functions, um, differentiation of several variables, partial derivatives. Just picking a few topics here. Chain rule, um, uh, gradient. Uh, multiple integration, uh, uh, surface integrals, um, line and surface integrals, Green's theorem. Who was Green anyway? That's a popular topic. How, is, how did he develop Green's theorem? What do we use Green's theorem for? Stokes theorem. Anyone know what Stokes theorem is for? 
it, there's there's a couple, but one is uh, particles moving through, you know, with viscosity and things like this, you know, through a medium. That Stokes theorem governs that. Divergence theorem, curl theorem. There's lots of theorems. There's lots of names. There's lots of possibilities. Tons of things and applications of every one of the things I just called out. Maybe in your field of study, you know, where do we use directional derivatives in your field of study or uh, uh, partial derivatives or the chain rule or, I mean, there's just tons of possibility. Who was chain? No, that's not it. Okay, never mind. Okay, lots of paper topics. All right, any other questions on? Yeah, yeah one to two pages, and that's pages of text. Remember, a page of text, if it starts here, goes to the bottom, and then on the second piece of paper, at least down that far on the second page. That's the minimum. Anything beyond that is fine, too. Okay. Any other questions? It's all there. You can read it on, when I get this out there, you can also read it when I get it updated and posted. All right. The next thing I'm going to post is my locator card. And since I don't yet quite know if all the classes are going to make or whatever, uh, I won't know that until I uh, meet with my next class. But I think I have a pretty good idea. But I'll have that all out there and post that on Blackboard. I'll post all of your um, PowerPoints. And here's the one I think, if I'm remembering right, I think it's 14. Chapter 14 is too big. For me to post those PowerPoints. You'll see them in, when we're doing it in class, but I don't think, I think the file is too big on here for uh, Blackboard to accept. And since it's proprietary here, I can't break it up. They don't let me do that. So, uh, so I think that's the one. I'm trying to remember which chapter it was, but it seems like it was that one. Okay. So if you're missing one, that's why it's missing. Okay. Uh, now, I, I just don't remember, Silva, if you were here the first day of class last term or whenever we talked about safety. Were you here for that? You were. Okay, so you've heard. You know what to do in case of weather. Interior load. Okay. Lowest level, interior. Okay. That's if we hear the emergency siren goes off. If we have fire, and we probably will have a fire drill sometime this term, maybe not in this class, but sometime this term. And if we do, just to remind you, uh, we go out the door, down the half flight of stairs, down the full flight of stairs, out the door at the bottom of those stairs. <coughs> and if we go where we're supposed to go, we go to this parking lot right down there. Stay together as a group until I get down there, call the roll, make sure everybody's accounted for, and then they'll probably talk to us or something. That's for a drill. The last time we had a drill, they wanted everybody to go out the same door, and that just made a, a huge mess, and that's not what you're supposed to do. What I did, I took my class out of the door where we're supposed to, showed them where we were supposed to go, and then we went back to the parking lot. They said, they got sort of testy with me, but I said, look, you don't practice wrong behavior. You practice what you're supposed to do, not what's convenient. <laughs> you know what you're supposed to do. So they relented and said, we'll do it right this time. We'll see. Okay. So weather, fire, the third one. Third safety issue, active shooter. Remember that one? Any questions on any of them? Because all of you have sat through it before, two of you today, one out last term. There's not really any big reason to belabor that anymore, unless you have questions. Any questions? Okay. That said and done, we will start then in Chapter 10. Okay, and I usually, if I have time, I do actually a PowerPoint of the rest of Chapter 10, but since we don't have a lot of time this term, 
we won't. We'll just cover the two sections and I'll sort of go over things. Okay. So since no other questions on the research paper. Uh, I think I'm through with that. Okay. All right. Now I got to go back. And we'll start with chapter 10. Taking things a long time to open. Of course, these are pretty big files. This especially is is a big file, 7,000 kilobytes, so it's a pretty good sized file for this one. Okay, now, the figure you have in your book, these, these math books now have gotten to doing sort of discovery things, you know, just sort of out there in the blue things. Yeah, we can apply this to this, you know, but not telling you how. In your book, you see a figure of um, infinite series allows you to make sense of a process that iterates infinitely as occurs in fractals generating pictures such as one in your text. But I don't see anyone with a text. This is another one. And again, yeah, you two know you may not. Uh, in the course you were in linear algebra, right, this morning, no PowerPoints. This one, the PowerPoints really stink. They, they look at all that white space. So what I do typically is blow them up. No, not that kind. Uh, okay. Our knowledge of what stars are made of, not a very good sentence structure, I don't think, is based on the study of absorption spectra the sequences of wavelengths absorbed by gases in a star's atmosphere. Yay. You know, but it's sort of leading to absorption spectra, spectra really turn out to be an infinite series. Okay. Usually we only focus on the major ones and we don't get all of them, but you know, the major ones. And that's how they draw pictures such as this. My guess is picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and it is beautiful, okay, um, but this is a nebula, I'm thinking, before uh, a star is actually formed in the process of forming. Now, what this looks like is a star that's actually dying. I don't know if it is. It looks like a, what they call a planetary nebula, which is going to add more stuff to space. Now, that may be a long, 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 long way away, but that be so bright, I would think it's fairly close. So I don't know if these two are related or not, but it looks like it could be in one of those areas of the universe where there's a lot of new stars and stars being formed. Again, a pretty picture, blah, blah, but they haven't told you anything about the math of it, just that we use them here. So let's move on to see how we use them. All right. Um, Now, my slide set is from the old edition. Do you still have the old edition? Okay. And uh, the you you have the new edition. You're going to get the new edition, you think? Okay. Uh, there are others before this one. In fact, I'll write down a couple. Uh, the theory of infinite series is the third branch of calculus. Okay. That's how the chapter begins. First branch is differentiation, second branch, integration, third branch, infinite series. Okay? Theory of infinite series is the third branch of calculus in addition to differential and integral calculus. Infinite series yield new perspective on functions and on many interesting numbers. For example, here's just some examples of an infinite series. Are any of you familiar? Oh, I forget. I can't write on this in the zoom mode, so I have to get out of the zoom mode. 
to be able to write. And it's not working. Okay. And I can't get the black, so I'm going to do in dark purple. Okay. I'm going to try to do dark purple. Okay. Now, here's an example of an infinite series. Does anyone know what e to the x is? It's a function, right? Exponential function. E is interesting. It is just a number, but we think of it as a function too. And it is both. But e to the x is the number 2.7 blah, 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 as, a, as an irrational number raised to the x power. So it's a function of the variable x. Actually, it's the number raised to that variable x, but that we treat as a function. Now, any of you have a calculator? If you want to do e to the seventh, you find the key and do e to the seventh. So what is the calculator doing? Is the calculator actually taking that infinite irrational number e and multiplying it by itself seven times? No, that's not how your calculator calculates it. Here's what your calculator is doing. You don't see it, but it's doing this. Here is the infinite series that represents e to the x. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x4 over 4 factorial plus x5 over 5 factorial plus dot dot dot. It goes on infinitely. Okay. Now I just sort of randomly picked out of the air e to the seventh. So some of you, you I think several of you pulled out calculators. You do e to the seventh and tell me what it is. Read it off your calculator. E Okay. E to the seventh. It's a huge number, isn't it? It's, uh, oh, okay, not too bad. Say again, one, one zero, nine, six, six, nine, six, six three, 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 one, five, five six, eight. oh, eight. Okay, did I get it right then? There. Okay. Now. I can do the first one. One, okay? We're not very close, are we, to that answer. But let's add to it seven, right? X is seven. One plus seven is eight. Well, we're closer than we were a while ago, but we're not nearly there. Plus, seven squared is 49 divided, does anyone, does everyone know what two factorial means? Any of you not know what it means? If you're not sure, just say, what does it mean? It's two times one, two factorial. So that's just going to be two. So there we have eight plus 24 and a half, right? So that would be 32 and a half, okay, to three terms. That's it. Well, we're closer to 1,096 than we were at 8, but it's still not very close. Okay? So you say it's going to take a few years to get there, right? Let's see. Plus, someone's going, well, you don't have to help me with this. I think I can do this one. 7 cubed would then be 63, 343. Okay? Divided by, then what would 3 factorial be? 3 times 2 is 6. Okay, so if someone wants to be doing this, that 32.5 plus 643 divided by 6, so do that as we go, 32.5 plus 343.6 is 6. What does that give you?
67? 57. Okay, now is that just... That's just this divided by 6. Okay, add to that 32.5. Okay. Second? 89 point what? Point six. Point six. Okay, now you can leave all your decimals there. I'm just going to write a couple of them. Okay, we're a lot closer than we were a while ago, but let's do it one more time. Uh, seven times that would be 21. Well, you can do it faster than I can. Put plus 7 to the fourth power divided by, and what would 4 factorial be? No, 4 times 3 times 2. That'd be 24. So 7 to the 4th, you can do this faster than I can, 7 to the 4th divided by, what did I say, 24? Yeah. Say that again. 189.7. You know, we're making some progress, aren't we? Okay. Plus 7 to the 5th divided by 5 factorial. Really, what 5 factorial is 5 times 24, which is 120. Okay. So that one plus 7 to the 5th divided by 120. What does that give us? Three twenty nine point seven, is that what you said? Okay. Now you're adding the previous to that, right? I mean, yeah, right. Okay, good. Okay. Well, we got closer, but still a ways to go. Plus seven to the sixth power divided by. Let's see, this will be six times that will be seven twenty. Okay. Chose too big a number, but we're okay. What does that give us? Oh, okay. Say that again. Is that all? 492.8? 93.1. But still, still in the 400s. Surprising it's not going up faster than that, but I guess that's right. Plus. 7 to the 7th power, and then you've got on your calculators a factorial key divided by 7 factorial. Does everybody know how to find it? If you don't, I can help. faster than this, okay? That adds up to what? 666.5? 56.5, okay. You see we're getting there, okay? I don't want to take too much class time doing it, but we're getting there, uh, and we're going up. We were going up two or 300 at a time. No, more, yeah, about 200 at a time, something close to that. It does pick up a little bit of speed later, but uh, it'll take a while, but you're going to soon get, oh, actually, it slows down later. 
because as you get close to this, it then starts filling in and just getting a little more precise every time. So you would get there in time. Your calculator, that's exactly what it did though. It just did it really fast, you know. It was already programmed in just to do that. Because you're doing the same thing every time. Plus the same number raised to the next power divided by that power, that number factorial. That's how you get there. I wish I'd have chosen something smaller than the seven. Let's just do it with three just to go back and convince ourselves. Let's do e to the third. What is that? Say that one more time. Two zero point, is that what you said? Zero, eight five, give me a few more digits. Five, three, six, nine, two. Okay. So let's see what we can do here. See, one, we're pretty close. Plus three, that would be four. Okay. Plus um, nine over two. That would be four and a half. That would be 8.5. Okay. Plus 27 over 6. You can start going from there. Start with 8.5 and do plus 27 over 6 plus give me the answer. Eight point five plus twenty seven over six. Eight plus five plus twenty seven over six. Huh? Eight point five plus twenty seven over six. Second. Thirteen. Okay. Plus. Uh, 3 to the 4th, which is 81, so I would just do 81 over 4 factorial, or 24, whatever that is. And that would be 16.375 plus uh, 3 to the 5th over 120, I know what that is. 17 17.4. Blah blah blah, plus three to the six over six factorial. I think that was seven twenty. We decided. Eighteen point four three. Blah blah blah, plus three to the seventh over seven factorial. Eighteen point eight. Now notice it's sort of slowing down some now, and it's going to keep slowing down, but it's going to gradually approach this, and then get closer and closer and closer. It may take a while, but it'll get there. Okay. And that's what your calculator is doing. Only it's doing it very fast, setting those up. So that's an example of a function that you do all the time on the calculator. Guess what? A log function, a sine function. A tangent function, a cosine function, all those functions can be expressed as infinite series. Different infinite series, but they can be. Okay? Not only that, I think I'll erase all these, but things like just numbers. Pi force. So I'm going to punch that into a calculator, see what you get. Okay, four? Is that what you said? Okay. Okay, well, the number pi fourth happens to be this number. One minus one-third plus one-fifth 
minus one seventh plus one ninth minus one. Guess what would be next? Eleventh. Next. Plus one thirteenth. Minus one fifteenth. See, that's an infinite series. Okay? You see the pattern. Start punching it in. One minus one third. That will be two thirds. Point six six six, right? Plus a point two. Zero point eight six six six, right? You punch in all the numbers. I, I can't write them all down. I don't want to write them all down. I could, but okay, as many as your calculator will hold. Then do a minus one over seven. So you go back and do the whole thing. One minus one third plus one six minus one seventh. What would that give you? I would do the running one. Okay. One minus one third plus one six and uh, one fifth minus one seventh. What does that give you so far? Seven two blah 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 plus one ninth uh, point eight what eight eight three four oh eight three four I was going to say it better be less than the previous okay minus one eleventh four four plus one thirteenth. Point eight two zero nine minus one fifteenth. Okay, plus one seventeenth. Eight one. Okay, what's the next one? Minus one nineteenth. Okay, notice here. I'm, we're not going to do them all. I don't want to take too much time. One, too big. Point six, too small. Point eight six, too big. But then look at it. You overshoot, undershoot. But this overshoot is closer than it was before. This undershoot is closer than this one was before. Overshoot, undershoot, overshoot, undershoot. You're going to narrow it down until you get it. You bracket this number and you keep going and going and going. And you can actually get more digits in your calculator. Well, no, you can't do it on your calculator. But you can get exactly that number if you go long enough. I'm not going to suggest we take class time. That's what an infinite series does. Okay? So, everything you, you when you entered pi on your calculator, it didn't have that stored somewhere, I don't believe. It calculated it like that using an infinite series. Not this one, but an infinite series. Okay? All right. So, what in the world do we mean before we get to series? That was sort of the ooh la wah, you know. What we'll do now is actually talk about an infinite sequence. Okay? Now, everything we had there was a sequence, but when we add or subtract them, that becomes a series. Okay? So, we'll make that distinction. Here is a sequence. We're not adding anything to there, we're just doing. Let's take a whole here, and that's one. A half is one half. Half of that is one quarter. Half of that is one eighth. What would be the next in that sequence? One sixteenth, one thirty-second, one sixty-fourth, one one twenty-eighth, and on and on and on. That is a sequence. Not a series. Series would be a plus or minus in between those. A sequence is just a string of numbers, a set of numbers that have a relationship to the one before. What's the relationship of this number to that? It's half of it. So you take half of the previous number and you get the next number. Or another way to do it is uh, divide the previous number by two. Or you know, multiply by 0 0.5. Whatever is the same as taking half of the previous number. Okay, that's what a sequence is. Okay, uh, now you can also express that as a function. 
the function, oh, whoa, I forgot, I can't write on this screen. So, uh, the function that that is, is f of n, and this is a rather strange function, because this n is not a continuous variable, it is a number, you know, an integer, okay? And this will be 1 over 2 to the n, because when n is equal to 0, what is 2 to the 0th power? 1. 1 over 1 is 1. And when 1 is, when n is 1, it would be 1 half. When n is 2, that's 1 fourth. When n is 3, that's 1 eighth. So you can express that sequence as a function of an integer. Okay? And that's another way to express a sequence much more complex, you know, concise, okay? So, let's get to, ooh. All right. Sometimes the slides are out of order. In addition to being weird, they're out of order. I mean, way too small. Let's blow this up a little bit and so we can read it better. Here is your definition. The limit of a sequence. We say that a sub n that some sequence or n is some integer, so it's a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, we say that that sequence converges to some limit L, we say the sequence converges to the limit L, and we write the limit of that a sub n as n approaches infinity, is that limit L, or the shorthand way to say it, a is approaching L, as n is approaching infinity, okay, I would write that in there too. If, this is true, this converges, if for every epsilon greater than zero, that sort of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Good old differentiation and integration. For every epsilon greater than zero, there is a number m, now no deltas here, but m, such that as long as this a sub n minus l, the difference between those two, okay, absolute value of that is less than this number epsilon, that you just choose randomly that epsilon for every n greater than m. So if you choose some really small number, 0 0.003, okay, if you wanted that in your epsilon, then you just take this a sub n, operate it until you get the difference between, remember when we were doing it before, they were getting closer and closer together? You just don't go down until you get within 0 0.03, 0 0.001, whatever you choose for epsilon, then there's some m that for all the n's past that m, this difference is going to be less than the epsilon you chose. That means it converges. Okay? Now, if no limit exists, we say the a sub n diverges. We'll see examples of that. But... Let's just say if our a sub n was 2 to the n, is that going to converge? If n goes to infinity? No, they get huge in no time. That would be when n is 0, that would be 1. When n is 1, it would be 2. When n is 2, it would be 4, 8, 16. No, those are not going to converge to anything. They're getting infinitely big. Okay? So not all will converge. Okay, the two, the ones we looked at did the converge. The one I just gave you diverged. If the terms of increase, if the terms increase without bound, which is what I just gave you, we say that a sub n diverges to infinity. Like 2 to the n. That diverges to infinity, heading that up pretty quickly. Now, can it diverge and not go to infinity? How about this one? a to the n is negative 1 raised to the nth power. Negative 1 to the 0 power is 1. To the first power is negative 1. To the second power is 1. Right. Negative 1 to the second. To negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 1, 1. Negative 1, negative 1. Negative one. It's just alternating. Is that... Diverge is not diverging to infinity. It's not converging. It's diverging. 
but not to infinity. Okay? So you can have a limit that doesn't exist, but it doesn't go to infinity. Okay? Here's another dumb example. Uh, cosine to the 3 n. Okay? If cosine 3 times 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1. Okay? Cosine of 3 get in radian mode, that's some number, okay? Cosine of 6 is some other number. Cosine of what the other, 9, 12, no number, but I guarantee you one thing, those numbers are between plus 1 and minus 1, all right? So if you did that, you'd have, they, they're not, they're not any regular pattern, but they never get outside of plus or minus one, but they never converge to anything either. So that would be one that diverges as well. Okay. You could do sine, whatever. Okay, wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> now, here's a few examples. They gave the definition first and then... Uh, they're given the examples here. Here is what we call the general term. Okay? The general term is a sub n is equal to 1 minus 1 over n. Now, we usually, you can start anywhere, but they're telling a system let's start at 1. Why didn't we start this one at 0? We did the others. Yes, you can't do that. Okay, yeah, so you have to start somewhere other than zero. In fact, somewhere greater than zero. So start at one. But have integers now. Okay? So that would be what would be your first one. Right? And n is equal to one. Second. Zero, yeah. What's the next one? One half? You're reading my hand, aren't you? Okay, one. Okay. Next one? Two thirds? Three fourths? Four fifths? Five sixths? Six sevenths? Seven eighths? Okay. Now, that one's not getting smaller like we did before. But is it converging? Or is it diverging? Getting bigger, does bigger mean diverging? What does it look like? Or think about it. Another way you could express this is a to the n could be n over n minus 1 over n, right? Is it n over n 1? As long as n is greater, 1 or greater, right? So that would be n minus 1 over n. In other words, it's always, the numerator is always one less than the denominator. Somewhere out there you will have 5,843 over 5,844, okay? Is that in converging or diverging? Getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to one, but never getting there because the numerator is always one less than the number. Well, guess what? Looking at this form, if you say let n approach infinity, one over infinity is going to zero, right? One over an enormously large number is getting closer and closer to zero, never getting there, but getting closer. That would be 1 minus 0 would be 1. So it is converging to 1. I'm jumping ahead. We're not doing that yet. Okay, how about this one? Okay. Negative 1 to the nth power times n. Okay. n greater than or equal to 0. How about 0? n is equal to 0. What's that? 
zeros. Okay, I can do that one. Next one. Negative one. Got it. Next one. Positive two, right? Next one. Negative three. Next one. Positive four. Next one. Negative five. Okay. Converging or diverging? Say again. It's diverging. And actually, it's neither going to infinity or negative infinity. It alternates, but it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Can you do that one in your head? I can. Okay. Now, so we won't be the best of that. But that is a real live sequence. Okay? Anyone know, know what it is? Any of you had much physics? Atomic physics specifically. Okay? This is the Palmer series. Only works for the hydrogen atom but this defines the wavelength of the spectral lines of that come out of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and I think these are in millimeters or nanometers or something, but these are the wavelengths of that, uh, of, of, of the, that you get out of that. Pretty sure it's wavelength, not frequency. Yeah, I think that's right. And these, you can usually see the first three, you can't see the others, they just sort of stand together. You know, sort of like that first picture we had. And uh, because they're getting closer and closer together, but these form the specific spectral lines. Okay. Good old Balmer came up with that one. Congratulations, guy. I don't know how you did that. That could be a paper topic. Who in the world was Balmer? How did he develop this sequence? Any of those would be decent paper topics. Okay, so not all sequences are generated by a formula, okay? I don't think they give this one, so I'll just write this down. No, okay. Um, here is a sequence. Three, one, four, one, five, nine, Two, six. Now there's no formula for that. Let's see if we. Ah, I think I do. That is a sequence. Does anyone know how to get the next number in that sequence? already noted that y'all have some pretty high power calculators. What were you going to suggest? Look like you had some idea. Okay, and your high power calculator, punch in the number pi. Ooh, yes, that's what it is, isn't it? And isn't pi? 3.1415926. Again? What's the next one? 54. Any of you got calculators to go any further? Okay. That's what it is. It's the digits in the number pi. It's a sequence, but there's no formula for it. There's no thing except it's the digits in the number pi. Okay. So, sorry. Okay. That's the sequence in the digits. Yeah, I didn't know it was going to tell that. Okay. Uh, when a sub n is given by a formula, we refer to a sub n as the general term. I think that's what they used here. Yeah, general term. Okay. Um, a sequence in the next example is defined yet another way, and this is called a recursive relationship. Okay. And let's see if they have this one. I think not. Okay, so let's go back to this and we'll do it on this. Let's clear this out of the way. Okay, this is example one. 
Let me see if any of you are familiar with this. If you don't have books, I'm, I'm playing games with you, okay? Here is a sequence. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four. Anyone give me the next number in the sequence? It's a fairly famous sequence, too. A couple of paper topics could be in this one, too. It's not a number. I'll tell you that. Not like pi. When I show you, you're going to slap me or yourself one. Okay. What is one and one? Huh? What's the next one? 55, you're absolutely right. What's the next one? Eighty nine, next one. Right? Is, is that right? Yeah. See what we're doing? Okay. What's one and one? What's one and two? Oh yeah. Now, did I just make that up? No. God, not even the book made it up. This is a very, very famous sequence named the Fibonacci sequence. Have you ever heard of that? Okay, I'll spell it for you. He's Italian, I think. F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. -C -C -I. I think I got it right. Yeah, that's the Fibonacci sequence. All right, clever, huh? Not of any use, practical use, but just a clever little sequence, right? Wrong. Okay, have you ever heard of the golden ratio? Okay. Have you ever heard of the Parthenon, a built building in ancient Greece? Okay, you have Well, y'all aren't very well at now. I'm going to see. Um, okay. And by the way, this is a recursive. This doesn't have a, a general term like the others did, but it is, has got a form. Ace, ace of n is equal to ace of n minus 2 plus ace of n minus 1. I mean, in other words, the next number in the sequence is the sum of the previous two numbers in the sequence. Yeah. 2 is equal to 1 plus 1, 3 is equal to 1 plus 2, 5 is equal to 2. It's a recursive relationship, not a general term you know, like the others. Okay, how about Leonardo da Vinci? Heard of him? Okay, do you remember his fairly famous drawing? I mean, he was an artist, right? Mona Lisa, you know, that kind of, he's also a scientist, a physicist, an incredible one at that. He basically designed the first helicopter. I don't think if he ever flew it, you know, but he came up with the concept of it centuries before anyone ever flew a helicopter. But do you remember a figure that he showed? Yeah, and I'm not going to model it completely, obviously, but you know, uh, he had seen that the ratios of so many things about the human body follow the pattern of Fibonacci sequence. And it's called the golden ratio. I think, I'm pretty sure that's it. The uh, Parthenon is one of the most elegant buildings of ancient Greece. It has uh, columns along every side, and but the height to the width and everything, it just is so pleasant to look at, and the reason is everything follows the same ratio, that golden ratio, which comes from the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and... Uh, they show here in the text, and you all have your text, I wish you did, a um, sunflower. And if you've ever noticed in a sunflower, or think of a, a cockle shell, you know, a shell that you find at the beach, it spirals like that. Those spirals follow perfectly the Fibonacci golden ratio sequence. Tons of things in nature 
follow Fibonacci sequence. Now, I don't know why, but they do. And they are things that are perfectly proportional. Okay? Uh, and I'm pretty sure, I I'm, can't say this for certain, but I think most faces, the ratios between nose and head or eyes and things basically follow pretty closely the Fibonacci sequence. That's why most of the time they look pleasant. Okay, you know, uh, some more pleasant than others. Okay, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, and by the way, let me go and say this while I'm thinking of it. We have some very good German friends in, that live in Birmingham, and they are incredible at remembering birthdays and you know, other holidays and stuff. And for so many years, at least three or four years, uh, not every year, but they have given me a book either for my birthday or Christmas. Well, they sort of know I like books, but they like books too. And so many times they've been related to math. And one year they gave me one that was called The Math Book, okay? And what it was, I think it was 250 of the greatest discoveries in mathematics in history. This one author picked out his favorite, 250. And he describes it on one page, and on the opposite page is some illustration or, or figure that represents that, and they're beautiful. I mean, color, I mean, they're just gorgeous. It's a gorgeous book. And I read through it because it was just fascinating in a fairly short well, I'm a slow reader so it took me only a few weeks though, to read through this really fascinating I thought this is a great book to sit on our coffee table and people say ooh ah yeah I said no that's not where it belongs it belongs in the library so I donated it to the library here on this campus and that could be there's I'm trying to think how many there's at least one and I think several Fibonacci related articles in there. Those would be good paper topics. I mean, you could just go through that. Even if nothing else, just read through it and scan through it and say, wow. Yeah. I'm guessing there's probably five to seven or nine or something like that topics in that book that relate to prime numbers. Uh, I mean, prime numbers is something, but didn't know how many things are related to prime numbers. Okay? So if you just want to take a look at the library and see if you can find I can't remember the author's name. It's an unusual name. Uh, but the name of the book is The Math Book. Okay. Look it up and, and see. And you can even check it out if you want to. They may have it on reserve. I don't remember if they still do or not. Or it may be on the shelf. But I'm sure there's some on the Fibonacci sequence in there. At least one and probably several others. Okay. So that is an example of one recursive sequence. Okay. Example two, it gives you, let's see, what do they do? Yeah. They want you to, I think I'll erase this one. This is not Fibonacci, I don't think. Okay. Here's example two. Compute a sub two, a sub three, and a sub four for this. Here's what I'm going to give you. a sub one is equal to what? Okay, and then from there we have a sub n is equal to one half of a sub n minus one plus two over a sub n minus one. So I want you to calculate a sub two. Tell me what to write down. A sub 2 would start with what? 1 half of 1 plus 2 over No, 1. A sub n minus 1 is a, uh, if If n is 2, n minus 1 is 1, and a sub 1 is 1, right? Got it? Okay. So this would be 1 half of 3, which would be 
three halves, right? Can you tell me what a sub 3 is? A sub 3. How do you begin? One half of three halves, right? That's a sub m minus 1. That would be, if a sub 3, a sub 3 minus 1 would be a sub 2, that would be three halves, plus 2 over three halves, right? Okay, going to take a little work on that one. That would be one half of three halves plus, what would that be? be four-thirds huh would that be is that right okay now what would that be one half of least common denominator here is six and that would be nine six plus eight six which is seventeen twelfths right a sub three Thank you for not telling us to go to a to sub 9, but they did say go to a sub 4. What would a sub 4 be? done it right so far? 24, 17. I almost want to just leave it like that, but I guess not. Let's see what it gives us. One half of, ooh, what in the world is a least common name on that? Like I'm an denominator there. Uh, say again? I think you just multiply them together. There's no common thing. What does that give you? 577, thank you. Is what? 204, okay. Let me get that corrected. 204. Ah! Okay, and the first will be Two zero. Whoa, no. Seventeen times seventeen is second. Three two eighty nine. I should know that. Okay, and see this one should be a little easier. That'd be two eighty eight. Is that right? Okay. This is bizarre looking, isn't it? Okay. And let's see what that would do up. 289 plus 288 would be 577. Uh, is that right? Over 408. Is that what they get? I'm so glad you gave us this one. This is such a pretty little thing. All right. Now. What they suggest to us is write these in decimal forms. What is, I can do 1, that's 1. In fact, I can do a sub 2, that's 1.5. You do 17 divided by 12. A 
what you get. 416 and 66666, yeah, okay. And then this one would be 4, 2, any more? One. Blah, 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 blah. We'll just do that. Does that sound like it's getting close to something? What? Huh? Okay. I think it's getting close to the square root of 2. See what the square root of 2 is. Not too bad, huh? It's getting there fairly quickly. So I'm going to make a guess that gives us the square root of 2. Okay? Now I'm going to make another guess here. I wonder if we put a 3 here and a 3 here, if that would give us the square root of 3. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. It might. I mean, I don't know. Okay? But that's probably how your calculator calculates what the square root of 2 is. It doesn't go through and do a square root operation that is really hairy if you've ever done it. I doubt if you have. They used to make us do it, but I don't think they make people do it anymore. But uh, this is how your calculator does it in infinite series. That infinite series. Okay? I'm guessing. Okay? They don't tell it. Oh, yes, they do. On the side note, they say. You may recognize this sequence in example 2 as a sequence of the approximation of the square root of 2 produced by Newton's method with a starting value of a sub 1 equal 1. Okay, now I don't know if y'all remember Newton's method, but it's a pretty handy dandy little thing. Okay, and getting, I see people are packing up. Is that because it's sad time? Oh, isn't it? Yeah, I knew y'all thought it was sad. Okay. So anyway, we got through example two. We will, I thought we just did the definition of a sequence. No. The limit of a sequence. We did definition of a sequence. We'll define what the limit of the sequence is next time. Okay, I think that's, oh, that's the one we're on. Wait a minute. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that, folks. The new edition has a definition of a sequence that the slideshow doesn't, and I skip that completely. A sequence a sub n is an ordered collection of numbers defined by a function f on a set of sequential integers, and the value a sub n is equal to f sub n is called the terms of the sequence, and n is called the index. Informally, we think of a sequence a sub n in in, as a list of terms, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. The sequence does not have to start at n equal 1. It could be n equal 0, n equal 2, or that Balmer series started at n equal 3. So in any words, I forgot to do that. We've already done this one. I didn't realize we had. I was wondering why it came so soon. We'll start with this next slide at the top of page 515. Sorry about that. All right, good deal. I don't think we got far enough for you to have any homework exercises yet. We probably did, but none of you have your books yet, except, well, you two have to have your books, all right? But you haven't purchased yet? Okay. I think you can do uh, exercises starting with, this is, this is funny. Uh, I think you can do one <coughs> and try doing any of the odds three through 11. We may not have done enough for you to do those, but try. And it says use theorem 1. We haven't done theorem 1 yet. So stop at 3 through, I'm, yeah, 3 through 11. Oh, on page uh, 521 in the new text. Uh, I don't know what page it is in yours. Um, and then it says find the formula for the nth term of the sequence, number 13. Try number 13 as well. I think you should be able to do that. Okay. By the way, those answers, the odd answers, are in the back of the book, so you can check them. And these are not for turning in. These are just for your practice. So do it. I think it'll benefit you greatly when it comes time for the next test or first test or whatever. 
All right, good deal. Any questions? We'll see you in a week. So bizarre, okay. We just got started and now have a holiday.